Proverbs chapter number 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine, bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh to the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. Now, we've already covered a few things here, but Solomon's saying, listen to wisdom, and he's saying my wisdom because God gave it to him. What did Solomon ask the Lord for? Wisdom to judge his people righteously. So when he says my wisdom, he's not talking about his understanding, he's talking about the understanding that God gave to him. Now, we might as well hit it, God told me to say it, not in my notes, but if God gave you a gift. If God gives you a blessing to use for His honor and His glory, you are responsible for safeguarding it. If God gave you the ability to sing, one, if you don't use it, God may take it away from you give it to somebody else. But two, if God gave you the ability to sing, you can't go out chain smoking all night and then expect to get up on Sunday morning and sound like an angel. Okay, but in addition, one step further, Solomon, God gave him wisdom He's done his best up to this point. We know that by the end he fails because in his old age he bows down and worships false gods. He didn't protect his wisdom. But see, Solomon understood that wisdom was so important and such a precious gift of God, he's trying to preserve it for the next generation. But if God gave you a burden to sing hymns, songs, spiritual songs unto God, and he gives you such a burden to do it that when you get up and do it, you're singing it to him, you may want to instill that into future generations. You want to know why people don't sing the old songs of Zion anymore? Because nobody taught them that they were important. Nobody shared their burden with them on why singing those songs were important. If God gave you the ability to teach a Sunday school class, maybe instill in the next generation the joys of being able to teach God's truths to a younger generation. When you make your burden, God may have given it a gift to you. And everybody that reads the book of Proverbs may not understand all that Solomon wrote down. But what God wanted them to find, they will find. That person may never grow up to be a Sunday school teacher, but they may be a great witness on the job because they've understood the truths of giving the knowledge of God to others, shining a light, sowing the seed of the gospel. Right, sharing your birth, protecting it, but also showing others why it's important to respect, to honor, and to protect that gift that God gave you it may just inspire other people to use their gift for God. That wasn't in my notes, but that's free. There you go. All of my Sunday school's free. We never take an offering when I when I get done, brother Thad. It's all free. So hey, didn't cost you anything. But we get to. Verse number three, for the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. A new idea always sounds good the first time you hear it. When it's something you've never heard before, part of your flesh is captivated. It's in awe. Man, that sounds great. Right? Stimulus package sounds really good until you figure out that, oh, hey, we're going to have to pay all that back eventually. Yep. That's just another reason for them to hike up our taxes. And hey, there are people that live in places like St. Lucia where over 50% of their check goes to the government. There are places like Italy where nearly 80% of their income goes back to the government in taxes. They've reverted to a barter system over there. They don't use money most of the time. It's goods and services. Well, hey, if you fix my refrigerator, I'll fix your motorcycle. Because if you paid them, they'd have to give 80% of that back to the government. Or if they paid you, you'd be living off of 20%. And you say, well, we didn't think of that at the time. Yeah, no, but now we're paying people 900 bucks more a week to sit at home and do nothing. 
And they're not spending it, they're saving it. And I'll tell you right now, most of them don't want to go back to work because they're making more money off work, even though their jobs have opened back up. But don't know how we got on all that. But a new idea sounds good when it's well articulated. And the things of the world are always best foot forward. You only get to see the, the good side, if you will. Well, I, people like Sydney are like, no, 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 take a picture from this side. It's my good side. I don't know what that means. I look the same from both sides, except one side I got a part in my hair and the other side I don't. That's pretty much it. And depending on how well good job I did shaving, one of the lines on my face may be straighter than another one. Okay? But I look the same from both sides. Well, not the things of the world. The world will put up on the billboard everybody having a good time with bottles of alcohol all around, but they don't show you the back of the board where people are spending every dime that they have trying to get to the end of another bottle. Right? The words of a way... You can make anything sound good. But things other than the things of God, the knowledge of God, the instruction of God, true wisdom, they may sound sweet, and it goes on to say that her mouth is smoother than oil, your flesh, Satan and the world are slicker than any used car salesman. Slicker than any door-to-door -door salesman. They can have your wallet before you even realize that you're going to buy it. Right? Well, why is that? Because the moment they can get you to take a step away from God, in your heart, you've already turned from God. And a man cannot serve two masters. If they can just get you to consider it, they've already halfway won the battle. And if they can get you just to commit to take a little step away from God, spiritually speaking, you're already in a far country. Whereas you say, well, I, that's where I was a minute ago, and I'm still right here. But in your heart, you're already long gone. Hook, line, and sinker, you've bought it. That's why it's such a dangerous thing when we give ear to things that are not of God. It says that strange woman, her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Hear me now therefore, O children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. In other words, he's saying, I've tested out these words the way that Jesus would have done it in a parable, these words are a solid rock that you can build on. I've seen the tides of life. I've seen the winds of life. I've seen the storms of life try to move the wisdom that God gave me and it's still staying strong. He says, I've looked around in the wisdom and the honeycomb of the world. As soon as the wind starts blowing, it disappears like the sands. Can't build on that. You can for a time, but it won't last. Her feet go down to death. What's that mean? All you can see is like that Venus flytrap. The reason that it attracts those flies is because the color pattern of that Venus flytrap is appealing to the fly. And when the fly lands on something that it thinks is food, next thing you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Eating. That's what I'm looking for. Eating. Trapped. Can't get out. Right? I can't remember what movie. It was Men in Black. Might have been Men in Black too. There was a guy named Bob. Bob looked like a little flower that came out of the sewer grate. And then Jay's new partner is, starts grabbing onto it and being like, listen, Bob, you got to get out of the subway. Next thing you know, Bob's like a 100-foot tall lizard or like worm that's eating subway cars. But all he could see was a little thing that came out of the grave. That's what these words are. The feet go down to hell, but all you can see is what's above the surface. It's going to take hold on you and drag you beneath those sands. Not quicksand, but you're going to find out there's a sinkhole there. You get dragged in. Ways lead to destruction. The end there is sharp two-edged sword. It's always painful when you build, when you invest, when you make yourself a disciple of the wisdom of the world. Okay, and we're going somewhere. Just hang on. 
Verse number seven, hear me now, old children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh to the door of her house. Verse number nine, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. You put yourself in bondage when you walk away from the instruction of God. He broke the chains of sin, broke the chains of the world and of the devil that were on you when he got saved. But when we return to it, doesn't have to be riotous living, doesn't have to be living in open wickedness. Just serving or desiring or making your life revolve around things of the world puts you into bondage. You want to know why verse number 9, verse number 10 means so much to me? Because of those two verses, I'll probably never finish my law education. Because I was miserable in what I was doing. I sought God saying, Lord, should I start looking for a different job? He gave me these two verses. In order to get where I would have wanted to be as an attorney, I'd have had to give, for a time, my honor unto others, years unto the cruel. Strangers would have been filled with my wealth, and my labors would have been in the house of a stranger. I'd have been doing so much for other people. I'd have been giving myself away in the hope that one day I'd get to be able to do what I want to do. Y'all know me. I'm a debater. I would have loved to have been in a courtroom every day trying to discern the interpretation of laws, how things should be applied, arguing those points. I'd have loved that. You know what I hate? Paperwork. You know what I hate? Busy work. You know what I hate? People that do something just so that they can bill their client for about $150 an hour. They're all about this instead of what you're actually supposed to be doing. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So then the answer is, well, either I do something that I really don't want to do for the rest of my life and be miserable the entire time, or I'm going to have to go into some, you know, sky rise office building, probably in downtown Cincinnati, have to wear wingtip shoes to work every day, which I don't have a problem with wingtip shoes. It's just that every day, very uncomfortable. Right? If I wear a certain type of shoe for too long, my feet start hurting. I don't know if that's, yeah, maybe I'm on the inside older than most of you, but I have that problem. If I wear the same pair of boots for about three days in a row, my feet start hurting. I don't know. If I cycle them, I'm good. What's, what's my point? I'd have been indentured to somebody else until I finally earned the right to start taking the cases that I want to take. What are what, you saying? Same thing applies to the knowledge and the instruction of the world. Instead of investing in gold, silver, precious gems for the kingdom of heaven, instead of investing in other people, putting the love of God, allowing it to shine through you, investing it into others so that you can edify the saints, so that you can encourage the downtrodden, so that maybe you can bind up the wounds of that person like the Good Samaritan, that that Jew wouldn't have spit on the Samaritan if he was on fire. But yet the Samaritan poured oil in his wounds, bound him up, paid for all of his medical treatment, and said, if I owe more when I come back through, I'll pay it again. Didn't expect anything for it. Why? Because it was the honorable thing to do. But they wouldn't have done it for me. But you never know this side of heaven what that one act did to that person to soften their heart. So that God might have been able to bring somebody else along and show them the light of the gospel. But what's the alternative? Laying up treasures here? Laying up vanities for myself? Investing in something that a hundred years from now, it's not going to matter how much I played Call of Duty and how good or bad I was at it. But I do use it to relax and to vent because I think it's better to uh, shoot people online when it doesn't really matter than actually going out and doing it in real life. Okay, it's a better alternative. No, it's just competitive. It's fun. Nothing wrong with it as long as I don't start giving away my study time to the place. In fact, I haven't played in a while. I've been playing a racing game. Brother Peter knows all about them. He introduced me to it. It's his fault because he showed me Gran Turismo 2 back in the day when he had a sleepover for the young boys of the class, or young boys of the church. I got hooked ever since. Good, but... My life doesn't revolve around me. Yeah, I've seen things on YouTube. People have like real car setups in their basement just to play racing games. Seats, steering wheels, shifters, brakes, gas, 
got TV screens that wrap all the way around because they want to be the best. What is that? That's foolishness. But there are people that that's, they suffer through work all day just to get back home and play video games. There are people that suffer through work all day just to get home and get back on Netflix. There are people that suffer through work all day just so that they can go out and party with their friends the night before, then wake up more miserable the next day and go through it all again to repeat the cycle. There are people that go through work, hate their job, hate what they're doing because their focus is on what they would rather be doing than what they're doing right now. And what do they try to save up for? A house, a triple crown? You can get one. They're really not all that expensive if you get them on the real far out fringes. And what do you want? The Mercedes? Why? So that to change a tire it's going to cost you about five grand? If, you, if your light bulb goes out, you've got to take off the whole quarter panel on the front fender just to change the light bulb, and then you get a bill for about 1500 bucks. Yeah, it's a smooth ride until something breaks. What are they striving for? The esteem of others? People are fickle. People are liable to change their mind on anything in any second of the day. But yet so many people put stock in that. And what are they doing? They're giving their honor unto others. They're giving their years unto the cruel. The world is cruel. It will take you for everything you've got and give you a morsel back just to keep you hooked. There's this thing called Stockholm Syndrome. It's where people that were taken captive start thinking of their captors as their friends because of an experiment that happened in Stockholm. And when people say, well, we've come to liberate you, no, I want to be here. They didn't take me. I came of my own free will. Or maybe they took me, but I want to stay. What is it? They've given themselves away. And now they've become a part of the thing that once they would have said, no, I don't want to go in there. I'd lose a whole lot. But now they've lost it all, and where they are is all that they have left. And they don't want to let go of it. Strangers be filled with your wealth. Not just talking about monetary wealth. Strangers being filled with your happiness, your joy, your strength. Where they rob you of everything to make themselves stronger, more presentable. Not talking about things like a job. A job is, is that people pay you because you add value to the company. That's ideally how it's supposed to work. Doesn't always paint out that way. But that is a quid pro quo. That is the economy working. It's better for them to have you so they give you part of the profit. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about where you take what you've earned and you show up and give it away freely. They rob you of it because you think, well, this isn't as important as being associated with that. Or this isn't as important as the thrill I get of doing this, that, or the other. But I say that labor is being the house of a stranger. Everything you're doing is for somebody else and you'll never see the fruit of it. But you know what it all revolves around? Where it all starts? Verse number nine, Lest thou give thine honor unto others. But what is honor? You'll find it a whole lot in the Bible, I think around 190 times. Jesus said that a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country. Jesus also said that if you honor the Father, you'll honor the Son. Because if you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. What is honor? Well, Webster's, there's about 12 different definitions for the same word. You know what it all boils down to? Honor is the esteem or the exalting of someone by another. But see, we're not talking about the honor of men because you're giving away the honor that you already had in order to obtain the honor of men. So what's the honor that he's talking about here? It's talking about the esteem or the regard of God. Now, we could spend a whole lot of time on a whole bunch of different things. But the, when you wake up every morning, the honor of God, having God's honor or God's favor in your life should be the most valuable thing to you. But how often do we actually think, well, what does God think about what I'm doing right now? 
What does God think about what I did yesterday? What does God think about what I have planned for today? Some people regard the honor of their spouse more than they do the honor of God. We think more about what the significant other thinks than we do about what God thinks. Some of us are more concerned with what our kids think about us than what God thinks about us. Some of us are more concerned about what our boss thinks about us than whether or not God's pleased with us. Some of us care more about what companions and friends say. Some of us care about people that don't even know we exist, but we're trying to impress them. You don't believe me? There's a whole bunch of people chasing fame and fortune on the internet, making videos, putting them up on YouTube or TikTok or Facebook or wherever it is, just hoping that people that they don't know will pay them attention and they can make a living doing that. There's a whole bunch of people that try to get the esteem or the accolades of the world, but what do they really matter? Employee of the week don't mean too much when you realize that there's 51 other people that are going to get it that year. Well, well, just being honest. Employee of the month, you may get a special parking space for four weeks. Maybe five, depending on how the days of the month fall. And you try so hard, you get it, and you just realize, oh, nothing has changed. You know what will change your life? The esteem and the favor of God. You know what will make hard days more endurable? The esteem and the favor of God. That is our honor. So with the Lord's help, we're going to teach on this morning living an honorable life. Because you know what has happened? Many Christians don't live honorably. They may have the esteem or the accolades or the regard of others, but they do not have the seal of God stamped upon their life. And that's why the rest of the world thinks that the church wasn't essential, wasn't necessary to have open during a COVID shutdown. That's why the rest of the world thought, well, you know what? We kind of got used to live streaming, so we're just going to do one service a week now, and we might live stream the rest. What is it? People are giving away the wisdom and the instruction and the valuable things of God to try and impress other people. You want to know why most pastors nowadays are politicians? Because they care more about what the people in the audience think than what God thinks. They cater their teachings to people rather than preaching the anointed word of God with unction and power. Everything can be boiled down to, well, are you doing it? for the honor and glory of God. Are you doing it because it's the right thing to do or are you doing it to try and get something? Because you can serve God the wrong way and not get honor. Look at King Saul. He disobeyed God, didn't kill the king, took all those livestock that he was supposed to kill, and when Samuel shows up and says, hey, is that not the bleeding of sheep that I hear? What's this guy doing here? God didn't tell you to do that. He said, well, we took him prisoner and we were going to sacrifice all those animals to God. He said, obedience is greater than sacrifice. You can do the right thing the wrong way and not have honor. And the most important thing in our life should be that when we lay our head down on our pillow at night, when we wake up in the morning, we know that our life is honorable in the eyes of God. Well, few verses on what is on how to live an honorable life. Proverbs 21, 21 says, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness, and honor. If you want honor, you must live a life that follows after righteousness. What's that? Living as God instructed you to live. That's a separated life. That's a life where you do it not just because somebody told you to do it, but because God has convicted you that it's the right thing for you to do deep down in your heart. Those that follow after righteousness have been convinced by God that that's what they need to do, and they follow after it. They don't just pursue it for a little bit. They don't tail it for a while and see if it's something that they might be interested in. No, no, no. They get as close as they can to God and try their best to follow after His righteousness. Well, you want honor. It also says, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy. I'm guilty of it probably more than anybody else. Do you ever hold other people to different standards? 
than what you would expect people to, you know, hold you to? Give me an example. Well, what if somebody owes you money, the day comes that they're supposed to pay you, they don't show up, what's your first reaction? I'm going to kill them. Right? Or I'm going to go find them. I'm going to call them. I'm going to confront them in some way. Right? But on the other way around, we'd be calling up, hey, you don't, hey, you don't understand. Check hadn't cleared the bank yet for my last paycheck. I have it. It's just not in the bank account yet. What would we expect? Mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What does Proverbs 21, 21 say? That he that follows after righteousness and mercy shall find life, righteousness, and honor. You know why it's honorable to show mercy? Because God showed mercy to you. Well, they don't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. I get smacked upside the back of the head a lot by the Holy Ghost. With the reminder, well, what did you deserve? You're right, Lord. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. Or I shouldn't have thought that way. Thank you for reminding me. If you seek after righteousness, you're going to find it. Sometimes you might find it because you obeyed. Other times you might find it because God corrects you. That's what we just read in chapter number 5 of Proverbs. Listen to my wisdom. His instruction. You know what reproof and instruction is? That's showing us what righteousness is when we didn't know what it was. Or when we failed to meet righteousness. Correction's not a bad thing as long as you learn from it. Because then you only got to go through it once. But if you seek after righteousness and mercy, you'll find life, righteousness, and honor. Well, Proverbs 18, 12 says, Before destruction of the heart of before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And before honor is humility. You want to be destroyed? Be haughty, be prideful, be consumed with self. But if you want honor, you must first become humble. You must lower yourself. You've got to knock yourself down a few pegs. You have to understand who you really are. Where do you find that? With the wisdom of God. With the instruction of God. Every time I think that I might have a good idea, I might, you know, feel about patting myself on the back. Wait a second, my heart's deceitfully wicked. Nobody can know it. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. The only reason that I had that idea is because God's blessed me with the ability to have the idea. So I'll give God the credit for the idea. I'll give God credit for everything in my life because he's the one that either orchestrated it, blessed me with the ability to do it, or just gave me grace and mercy and didn't give me what I deserved. Amen. If you want honor, you must humble yourself. I mean, John said it this way, I must decrease. Why? Because he must increase. There's only so much room inside of me. I got to get smaller so that he can get bigger inside of me. He's infinite. He's expand so expansive we can't even fathom it. He's the holy God of heaven. Jehovah. But when it comes to me, I am finite. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many things I can do in the day. And I'm either pursuing self or I'm allowing him to live through me. So I got to get out of the way. Why? Because somebody told me to? No, 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 no. Because I have learned that when he lives through me, things are a whole lot better. Not just for now, for tomorrow. Not just for me, for others. Why? Because he shows honor when I am obedient. What's honor? I'm not saying that an honorable life is one where you're going to have all you know, the desires of your heart. You're going to be driving the car that you want to drive. You're going to be doing this, that, or the other. No, no, no. But God will be pleased with you. That should be the only desire of our life. If you want God to be pleased, you must first humble yourself so that He can exalt you in due time. You've got to be willing to let God work on you before God can put you where he wants you to be a vessel of honor unto him. Okay, well, Proverbs 13, 18 says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. 
But he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Think of it this way. Jesus is our master. Why? Because he bought us off the auction block of sin. We are his stewards, his servants. We have no right to be in his house, but yet he invited us anyway. We have no right to dine at the master's table, but yet he says, come and dine. We ought to be humbled by that. And the master understands that we weren't equipped, we weren't trained from day one to be able to be the steward or the servant that he wants us to be. So when I messed up out of love, he reproved me. But if I accept that, he that regardeth reproof, that means applies it to his life, makes it a part of him, says, I don't want to keep failing, I want to do it the way that the master wants it to do. He will be honored. Because one, he accepted it, but two, from then on out, he'll do it the right way. But poverty and shame to be in him that refuseth instruction. You want God to be pleased with your life? Stop arguing with God every time that he gives you instruction or reproof. Stop rejecting what God wants for you and embrace it. Repent of the fact that you have not been repentant and surrender it unto God. Because if you do as the Master says, you will be honored. If you don't, you're not. If you are in charge of a great estate, if the Father entrusted you as the son or the daughter to run his affairs, and you had a servant that kept messing everything up, if you had a servant that when they went out and mowed the grass, it looked like you know just a bunch of donkeys had gone through and grazed a little bit, everything's uneven, Things are all weird. It's not evenly done. What are you going to do? You're going to reprove that guy. Well, if he keeps doing it over and over and over, where is he going to find himself? Without a job and full of shame because he threw away the best opportunity that he had in his life. In poverty. Well, how much more do you think God wants us to be? A steward that he can show off to everybody else. Say, hey, not because he's something special. Not because he was, you know, a great heir of some kingdom and he came and knelt down and swore allegiance. No, no, no. Just because he's obedient. He does things the way that I like. Because I know that that's the best way for him to live. Because I have his best intentions at heart. That man will be honored. He will find a place. If you had the choice between the guy who kept messing up and the guy who was doing things, when you need somebody right by your side, who are you going to pick? The guy that does things right. The one that's been honored. Who finds themselves closest to the, to the master? Those that obey and humble themselves to the master. Understand that I may mess up, but if I do, I want to be corrected so that I can do it right the next time and every time after that. Proverbs 28, 18. Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. The servant that doesn't rush the master but allows the master to tell him when it's time to do something, he's the one that gets honored. The one that says, oh, well, the master's taking too long. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. They mess things up. They do things out of season. They do things out of time. You cut the grass too often, the grass is going to die. You cut the grass too short, you can't roll it into bays of hail. You cut down the wheat too soon, there's not going to be any seeds in there for you to take to the threshing floor and turn into flour. But he that waits upon the master, he shall be honored. He that has its ear attuned to the master's voice so that every time the master says, hey, I need this done, okay, I got it. But those that are standing there, supposedly ready for the master to use, but they're so far inside their head thinking about what they're going to do as soon as the master lets them go, when they're so far in their head thinking, well, I could be doing that, or, you know, I, I heard that somebody on a, on a different farm, they got it better. Their master's more lenient. I've heard some words that fell like honeycomb, but when I get over there, I'm going to find out that that guy was a tyrant. You know what's going to take to get off of that farm back to the master's going to have to come and get you and say, no, 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 he's mine. He's coming back with me. 
do I not wait on the master? But then, I'm running out of time. Ecclesiastes 10.1 says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. In any words, a little fly spoils the ointment. A man of reputation and honor, a little folly will ruin his honor. Again, you're either all in or you're all out. What is folly? Foolishness. What is foolish? To reject the instruction of God and embrace the desires of man, the wisdom of man, the things of the world. You have the very guidelines that the one who spoke the universe into existence left for you to live a life that was honorable and righteous before him. And when we reject that, that's the dumbest thing we could do. Especially if we know him in the free pardon of sin. When you know better and you do it, folly. What's it going to do? It's going to make you unhonorable to God. He won't be able to bless you because of your choices. Because we just don't care if God's pleased with our life. Then you want to know what happens when people stop caring about honor? Isaiah 5.13 Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Living an honorable life will keep you satisfied. You won't thirst. You won't be famished. But you want to know why Israel went into captivity? Because their honorable men forgot the knowledge of God. And they became unhonorable. And without the honor of God, they found themselves in a desert where they couldn't find food or water. And they were in captivity. They went into captivity because they lost their honor. Living honorably allows you to continually be in the free pardon of sin. To look into the perfect law of liberty because of honor. You reject honor. You reject God being pleased with your life. When you stop caring whether or not God bestows honor and favor upon you, whether you are esteemed of God, you're already in captivity. And the longer you keep yourself in captivity... The hungrier you're going to get, the more thirsty you're going to get. Until eventually, you're so famished that when you get back, you don't even resemble what you used to be. Because the moment you reject the favor of God, you spiritually start dying. You may still remember those verses, but you don't remember what they meant to you. You don't remember the things that God brought you through using those verses as the anchor for your soul. Yeah, you remember that message, but you don't remember what God gave to you out of that message. You remember it all, but you've lost the meaning in it all. And when you come back, you may know how to sing the songs. You may know how to shake hands. But on the inside, you're so anemic that you've got to start all over again, it feels like. Why? Because your honor didn't mean anything to you. Samson's honor didn't mean anything to him. He lost everything. David's honor not only caused him to kill one of his own friends, one of his most loyal generals, but at the same time he also caused a great many lives to be lost because the sword never left his house. He deprived himself of the ability to build the house of God because he had tainted bloody hands now. Because he required the blood of an innocent man at his hands. We can go on and on and on. Ananias and Sapphira. The honor and the esteem of God didn't mean much to them because they lied trying to get the esteem of men. What happened? Both died on the spot. Over and over again, what it, people stop caring about what God thinks concerning their lives. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's the one that said, take my yoke upon you because he wants to bear your burden. He said, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. He cares so much for us, but we get to the point where we just stop caring what he thinks. You say, well, I'd, I'd never. I guarantee you almost everybody in here has at some point. It's just how long we stayed there before God gave us a wake-up call and said, you remember when you used to care what I thought? Because here's the thing, if you don't care what God thinks, when he says come and dine, you're going to go eat somewhere else. When he says it's time to come worship, you're going to show up looking for spectacle or looking to judge other people. 
Or you're coming just to hang out with the people so you endure worship so that you can have fellowship after. You come for the accreditation of men, but really what you should desire is the approval of God. You want a happy life? Maybe not a happy life. You want a joyful life? There are a lot of days I'm not happy. Most of the time because I think people are stupid. But anyway. You want a joyful life? You want a satisfied life? Just do what God says and then be satisfied with the fact that the very Lord of heaven is satisfied with you. That should be all the honor, all the esteem that we need. The world may not consider it much, but an honorable man, eventually, God sends him out into the community to be a light, to be a vessel of honor. And the world, some may disdain, but others are going to say, what's that guy got that I don't? A relationship with God and a relationship that God is happy with. If you've got that, the world can't stop you. A government shutdown won't phase you. Because you're walking hand in hand with Jesus every day. And the esteem of God is so prevalent in your life that other people know that guy's close to God. That guy has to be close to God. Because there's no other way that he could have the life that he has unless God blessed him with it. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.